All right, this chapter right here, chapter eight, um, it's all about right triangles, okay? The whole entire chapter is just about a right triangle. It's hard to believe there's that, that much information, isn't there, about just a right triangle? But let's just, uh, let's just talk about some things that we know already about right triangles. So let me draw a nice little right triangle here. So what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a right triangle? 90 degrees, exactly. Okay, that right angle. It's called a right triangle for a reason. Because it has an angle that's 90 degrees. Can you have more than one 90 degree angle in a right triangle? Why not? Somebody tell me why. It's hard to add up to 180? You're on the right track. You can't, right. Yeah, you can't. If you have two angles that are 90 degrees, that's already 180 degrees, isn't it? All right? And you need a third angle, right? And so there's no way to have a third angle, and for all three of them to add up, you can't have a zero degree angle. So you, um, so you cannot have a right angle, or two right angles in a triangle. Let's talk about the other two angles right here. What about this angle right here and this angle right here? What do we know about those two angles? Okay, they're both acute. Very good. Okay, they're both acute angles. And on any right triangle, no matter how you draw the right triangle, the other two angles will always be acute angles, right? Which means they're both less than 90, right? Okay. Um, tell me something a little bit more specifically about this angle and this angle. They are acute. That's very they true. They add up to 90. They have to add up to 90 because, look, these two have to add up to 90. Then this is 90, right? And so that means they all add up to 180. Would you agree? So both of these angles, um, we'll say it like this. We'll say the acute angles of a right triangle of a right – I'll just – shorthand it like that. The acute angles of a right triangle are, I think we've used this word before, we've used the word supplementary. What, what did supplementary mean? They add up to what? To 180. What, what's the word if they add up to 90 degrees? Complementary, right. So the acute angles of a right angle are complementary. And I'll just write that in there. We're actually not even going to use that stuff in this lesson today. I'm just trying to th I'm just trying to get us thinking about right triangles a little bit, okay, before I really do what we're going to do today. So yeah, you know that these two angles are complementary, and that will come into play a little bit later on in the chapter, but I'm just, just trying to get us to think a little bit. Uh, let's name some of this stuff. What about this side right here? This side right here, see that, the longest side? That has a, uh, as a name. It's got a particular name. What do we call that side? I'll give you a hint. It's opposite the right angle. The side that's opposite the right angle is what? The hypotenuse. Very good. Okay, it's the hypotenuse. All right, it's the hypotenuse. Now, some people say, well, the hypotenuse, it's, it's the hypotenuse because it's the longest side. Is that why it's the hypotenuse? No, it's not the hypotenuse because it's the longest side, even though it is the longest side. It's the hypotenuse because it's opposite the right angle. Okay, it's very important. Because look, I could have a triangle. Let's do this. Watch. I'm gonna make the triangle looks like this. Alright. And this side right here, we'll call it A, that side right there is the longest side of that triangle. Does that mean that's the hypotenuse because it's the longest side of the triangle? No, it doesn't. Alright, in order to be a hypotenuse, it has to be opposite of what? A right angle. Is that a right angle? No, it's not. All right, so even though it's the longest side, the longest side isn't always the hypotenuse. But on a right triangle, though, on a right triangle, the hypotenuse is always the longest side. Follow me? Okay, you can only have a hypotenuse if you have a right triangle. And we're going to use that word hypotenuse quite a bit later on in the chapter. What are the other two sides of this right triangle called? If this one's the hypotenuse, what do we call this one? Any idea? Call it the leg, right? That's one leg. It's supposed to be an E. And that's a leg as well. And we're going to talk a lot about that later on in the chapter. Talking about the hypotenuse and the legs and the right triangles and the other, all these angles and all that kind of stuff. All right? Just trying to get you warmed up a little bit to this chapter. All right, that's enough of that. Let's do what we're actually going to do today. we got a key word that we're going to use. And we're going to use this word all less than long. Okay? And it's called a geometric mean. Jot that down. The geometric mean. Uh, what about that word mean? What kind of math thing have we done with the word? It's the average, right? Okay, it's the average. Now, we're not really going to look at this as, as an average. It's not really a true average. Um, I guess you could call it a geometric average, but, but you've seen that word before, right? 
So it does represent a number. The geometric mean does represent a number. And this is what we're going to do. I'm not going to go through really any explanation on why it is or anything like that. They really don't. They just kind of throw it out there and they say, this is how you do the geometric mean. A geometric, to, to find the geometric mean, what we have to do is we set up a proportion. We spent all last chapter talking about proportions, didn't we? Ratios and setting them equal to each other. This is a fraction. That little line right there is a little fraction bar. And that's a little fraction bar. And there's an equal sign between. So this is a proportion. Now, the geometric mean um, will do this. I'll just, there's four places. One, two, three, four. Everybody see that? The geometric mean actually takes up two of the places. It's right here and it's right here. So we'll say right now that the geometric mean is x. So how do you find, if they, they're going to ask you a question, they're going to say, find the geometric mean. And so, okay, as soon as you see that statement, if it says find the geometric mean, you're going to set up a little proportion, you're going to put an X up here on the top left, and you're going to put an X down here on the bottom right. They just have to be diagonal to each other. You can't have one directly on top of the other one. Everybody see that? Now, if you wanted to, you could have put the X down here on the bottom left and the bottom right, or the top right, sorry. You could have done it like that, and that would be fine. Just for some reason, I always put top left, bottom right. Okay, so if it says find the geometric mean, that's the first thing I'm going to do. All right, and then what are they going to say? They're going to say find the geometric mean, watch, they're going to say find the geometric mean between these two numbers. And they're going to throw some numbers out at you. Okay, and I'll just, um, let's use 3 and 5. Okay, so they're going to say find the geometric mean between one number and another number. Let's go back to this proportion. Where do you think you're going to put that 3 and 5? In those, spots. <laughs> in those empty spots right there. Exactly. So put the 3 right here and the 5 right there. It doesn't really matter that you put the 3 on the bottom. The 5 could have been there. The 3 could have been up here. It doesn't make any difference as long as they're diagonal to each other. Everybody see that? Now, guess what we're going to have to do? We're going to have to find what is the geometric mean. See, the geometric mean's in red and the x is in red. All right, so the x is the geometric mean. That's what you're trying to find. You're trying to solve for x. So what do we do? What kind of math do we do here? We did it all last chapter. Cross multiply, exactly. We cross multiply. All right, so it's is it 2x? Right, it's x squared. We're multiplying them together. x times x is x squared, isn't it? It's not 2x. If it was x plus x, that would be 2x. But x times x is x squared. And now, what do we do here? 3 times 5. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to write it out just so in your notes you see where you get that number from, okay? You may not have to do that when you actually do the problems, but I'm going to just write it out there. So what do we get? We get x squared equals what? 15. Is that my answer? Is the geometric mean 15? No. we got to get x by itself. How do we get rid of that squared? Square root, very good, okay? It's not the first time we've done that this year, is it? We've gotten rid of a square root before every once in a while. So we get rid of the square the square by uh, square rooting both sides. All right? That cancels out the squared, so we get x. And this is how you're going to leave it. You're going to leave it just like that, the square root of 15. You're not going to put it into a calculator. I'm going to even write that down. Do not... Um, I'll just say use. Well, I, I wouldn't want to say use because sometimes the numbers aren't as easy as 3 times 5. Don't, uh, don't do what? Don't write your answer. Don't write your answer. Um, I'll say this as a decimal. Right? Which means don't use a what? Calculator. I want to leave it like this because that right there is an exact answer. That's exact. Now you may not, at this point in your math career, you probably don't really care which one's an exact answer, what's an approximation, but later on when you get higher level math and stuff, they want exact answers a lot of times. Okay? Don't want it. What does it say? Don't write your answer as a decimal. Okay? No, I said in your upper level math, they usually want you to keep it as a, as a square root. Okay? Um, there are times. There's, there's definitely times where you're going to write your answer as a decimal. Sometimes you're going to keep it as an exact answer. Right now, okay, for what we're doing right now, I want you to keep it as an exact answer, which means keep it under a square root. The last class had a hard time with that. They just wanted, they wanted so bad to turn that into a decimal. Okay, and I had to fight them tooth and nail. 
But look, it's a lot easier. I'm trying to make it easier for you, give you a less one less step to do. You can just keep it the square root of 15. You don't have to put it into a calculator and um, and get some decimal number for this. Okay, all right. I'm trying to help you out. Okay, it's a little easier to do it this way. All right. When you get into algebra two, you're going to be working with square roots. Now look, in real life situations, if you if you, you know if you're an engineer, or if you're an architect, or something like that, you're doing something with numbers and it comes out to a square root. What are you going to do? You're actually going to put it into a calculator and get some decimal approximation. There's nothing wrong with using a calculator, but I want you just to get used to writing your answer like this. Is that all right? And it's easier. I'm making it easier for you. Give you one less step. Now, if I told you you had to put it in a calculator, then people would argue about that. Why can't I just keep it like this? <laughs> okay, keep it like this. Okay. For, for these kind of problems, for these kind of problems, just keep it like this. There are times when you can write it as a decimal. It's perfectly fine. But for right now, let's just keep it like that. All right, enough of that. You understand what we're doing? So if I ask you to find the geometric mean between two numbers, that's exactly what you would do. Let's do another problem. Let's um, find the geometric mean. Um, we'll just say this. Find, I'll put GM, is that all right? Find the geometric mean between... And I'm just making some numbers up. Um, let's do this between four and nine. All right. So if it says find the geometric mean, how are we setting this thing up? We're setting it up as a what? Okay, as a let's get a better word. What word did I use when I said it? What's a fraction equal to another fraction called? Yeah, well, one of them is a ratio, but when you have one equal to another one, it's called a Come on, we talked about this all last chapter. It starts with a P. Proportion. It's a proportion, okay? So find the geometric mean between 4 and 9. So I set up my proportion. Where do I put my geometric mean? I don't know what it is, do I? So where do I put it here? Where, where do I put it? Top left and bottom right. Now, if you wanted to, you could go bottom left and top right. It doesn't make any difference. I kind of just do it like this. What about the 4 and the 9? What are you going to do with the 4 and the 9? Stick them in the blank spots, exactly right. Put a 4 here and a 9 here. And now we got to solve for x, because that's what the geometric mean is. When they say find the geometric mean, that's what that's the x. Okay? So what are we going to do here? Cross multiply, right? So x times x is x squared. 4 times 9 is 36. Let's get rid of the square by taking the square root. Now watch. This time, I'm not going to leave it the square to 36. Why wouldn't I leave it here and I left it when it was square to 15? Because this comes out even. That's right. This is called a perfect square. It's a perfect square when you take the square root of it and it comes out to a perfectly whole number. Okay, perfect whole number. Everybody with me on that? So in this case, I do want you to get rid of the square root. So the square to 36 is just plain old 6. It's not a decimal, is it? All right. Remember that other one, the square root of 15? Let's do the square root of 15 and see what that is. The square root of 15. See how it comes out to all those numbers right there? And it doesn't even stop there. What happens? If, I, if my calculator was big enough and it could go enough places, what would happen to that decimal? just keeps on going forever and ever, okay? All right? This is an approximation. No matter how many decimal places you take it out, it's still an approximation. So this right here, the square root of 15, would be an exact number. 3.87 or however many places you want to round it would be an approximation. Is 6 an approximation? No, it's an exact number. It's just plain old 6. No less, no more. Okay? So I still want you to write it as an exact answer, but I always want you to simplify it if you can simplify it. Make sense? All right. Um, I think that's good enough for that. Where in the world we're going to use this geometric mean? Well, I'm glad you asked because... I'm going to show you. Did you even ask? I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. I'm going to draw a right triangle so everybody should be drawing this. Now, I'm going to draw the right triangle a little different looking. Usually, you see it up on one of its legs, don't you? Sitting on the leg. But this time, I'm going to have it sitting on the hypotenuse. For some reason, a lot of times in math books, what we're doing right here, they like to write it like this. So I've got a right triangle. It's laying flat on its hypotenuse. Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a line segment from the vertex of that right angle. And I'm going to draw it perpendicular 
to the hypotenuse. What does that mean, perpendicular? Does it mean I'm going to draw it like this? Like this? Straight? Let's get a better word. Perpendicular, right? Uh, I said perpendicular, didn't I? It's going to form a what then? It's going to form a right angle, okay? So that's perpendicular. We have a name for that. When I draw from a vertex perpendicular to an opposite side, and we've talked about that. We talked about that in the last chapter, actually, and I think we talked about it in another chapter before that. So this is like the third chapter this has popped up. Any idea what that's called when you go from a vertex perpendicular to the opposite side? What if I went from the uh, vertex to the midpoint of the opposite side? What would I call that line segment? That would be the what? It goes to the midpoint. It's the median. Do you remember that? Anybody here? Was anybody here for the last chapter <laughs> when we went over this stuff? Okay. You might have forgotten it, but this is called the altitude. Does that ring a bell at all? Thank goodness. Altitude. All right. This is the altitude. What's the altitude? When it goes from the vertex perpendicular to the opposite side this particular situation I'm going from the vertex of the right angle and I'm going perpendicular to the hypotenuse that's where this geometric mean stuff's gonna come in alright so this thing right there is called the altitude now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna label some things I'm gonna label some sides I'm gonna label this side A I'll call this side B and I'll call this altitude I'll call it C All right. And I'm going to call, look at this little segment from here to where it hits right here. I'm going to call that D. And then from where it hits all the way to the end, that bigger segment, I'm going to call that E. And then I'm going to call the whole entire hypotenuse, let's call that F. I could call it D plus E, couldn't I? But let's just use one letter and make it a little easier for us. All right, all I've done was label all my sides, and I've even labeled a couple of these segments, didn't I? All right, now this is really, really going to be important. Now, there's a reason why I put the A, B, and C in red, all right, because those are our three important things that we're going to deal with right here, all right? So we're really dealing with three things, okay? And they all have to deal with geometric means. The stuff that we did earlier about geometric means is going to come into play here. This is why we want to learn what the geometric mean means, okay? So let's see what we can do here. The first thing is all three things in red are actually geometric means. Let's do this one first. So that is actually a geometric mean. So I'm going to say C is a geometric mean between, I'll put BW for between, not black and white. Okay, between, watch. C is a geometric mean. I'm going to say it a little bit long ways without using the DNA. Here's what here's what they tell you in the book. They say the altitude, okay, drawn to the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Okay, so that's what we have right there. That's what C is, isn't it? An altitude drawn to the right to the hypotenuse. That altitude is the geometric mean between the two segments of the hypotenuse. You hear what I just said? It's not just bouncing off you, is it? Internalize what I'm trying to say. This altitude is the geometric mean between what? Between the two segments of the hypotenuse. And give me the letters now. D and E. Right. So C is the geometric mean between D and E. All right. So C is the geometric mean between the two uh, segments. I'll just say that. Okay. So Point C, is a, or line segment C, is a geometric mean between the two segments. These are my two segments, D and E. So how am I going to set that thing up? Well, C is a geometric mean, isn't it? So I set up my proportion. Where do I put the C? Top left, bottom right. Diagonal to each other, right? So C is a geometric mean between what and what? D and E, that's right. And let's make this a different color. Between D and E. Now, how would you solve for C? Now, you know what they're going to do, don't you? They're going to stick numbers in here, right, for D and for E. And what do you do? You put those numbers in here and then cross-multiply. So C squared equals whatever D times E is, right? And then you're going to take the square root just like we did before. Make sense? I'm just setting it up with the letters right now. We'll do some numbers in a second. All right? 
let's do the second thing. So C is a geometric mean. Get rid of that circle right now. What else did I say was a geometric mean? All the stuff in red. So A is a geometric mean. So A is a geometric mean between, not between the two segments because that would have been C, between the hypotenuse, the whole entire hypotenuse, and I'll call it the closest segment. I think that's the easiest way to say it. All right, these two segments, D and E are your two segments of your hypotenuse, right? Okay, right, be F and D, exactly. So A is now a geometric mean between the whole entire hypotenuse, which is F, and the segment of the hypotenuse that's closest to that side A. You see D? That's the one that's closest to A, isn't it? It's adjacent to it. If you look in the book, they'll say it's adjacent. All right. So how do we set that up then? Yep, A is now my geometric mean between what and what? Yep, between, I like to do the F first. It doesn't make any difference though. Between the whole hypotenuse, F, and the segment of the hypotenuse that's adjacent or closest to that angle A. So that would be side D, wouldn't it? Remember, A is your geometric mean. That's what you're solving for. Does that make any sense at all? And you know what they're going to do? They're going to put numbers in here, okay? So th these things in blue right here are all going to be numbers. You're going to put numbers in there, cross multiply, and then you're going to solve, in this case, for C, in this case, for A. Now, number three is pretty much the same thing, except instead of side A, instead of taking that leg, what do you think we're going to do now? Find B, right. So B is also a geometric mean. So B is a geometric mean between the hypotenuse, that's the same thing as what I have right there, and the what? The closest or the adjacent segment. All right, so we set up a little proportion here. What's our geometric mean this time? It's B, so I put the B here and I put the B here. Now between what and what this time? Yeah, on this one, it's the F and the E. Good. F and E. You getting that? So let's do it again. Watch. C. Without looking, I'll tell you what. Don't look at your notes, and I'll scooch this down just a little bit so you can't see it. C is the geometric mean between what and what? Talk to me. Between D and E. Good. A is the geometric mean between what and what? Yeah, let's go F and D. Right. Okay, the whole thing and then the closest one. B is the geometric mean between what and what? F and E. Make sense? It's pretty simple, isn't it? But it's going to be helpful because they're going to give you some segments in here and you're going to be able to find these other, um, these other lengths, which is pretty interesting. It all has to do with similar triangles. I didn't go through the explanation on why that stuff works. I could have, but um, I would have had more people sleeping than I have right now, which you should not be doing. Everybody should have their heads up and paying attention because this stuff is riveting, exciting stuff, isn't it? Sure it is. Um, let me try to read. I don't know if I copied that whole thing or not. Let's see. I did. Let's do some uh, examples now. Let's put some numbers in here. Um, let's say... I'm just going to make something up here. Let's say this is 7 and this is 10. Is that all right? And here's what I want you to solve for. I want you to solve for x, y, and z. Go ahead and do it. I'll give you a minute. All right? Look at your notes. It's the same thing that we did, all right, except I just stuck numbers in here. So look at your notes that you took and figure out the relationships, plug the numbers in, solve for x, solve for y, solve for z. Ready? Go. Okay, that's enough time. So let's get x. So x is a geometric mean. All, all three of these things in red are geometric means. I just did that so you could see which ones were which. Okay, so x is a geometric mean. So watch what we do. Set up a proportion, and you put the x here and the x here because that's a geometric mean. Well, x is a geometric mean between what and what? The two segments, which is 7 and 10, right? All right, so x is geometric mean between this segment and this segment. So you just stick them in here. Now the math is very easy. 
has just x squared equals 7 times 10, that's 70, and what do you do? Just take square root, and you can just leave it like that. Leave it the square root of 70. I'm fine with that. Okay? Quick and easy, wasn't it? Do you agree? You got you to admit, that's pretty easy. Yep. Let's do y. All right, so you set your proportion up. Y is also a geometric mean, so I can put it here and here. And then between what and what this time? Which is 7 and the whole hypotenuse. What is the whole hypotenuse? I didn't tell it to you. Yeah, you had to figure it out. You had to figure out the whole hypotenuse was 17, didn't you? And let's do that in blue. Oops, thought I changed it to blue. That's all right. All right, so that whole thing right there is 17. Okay? And so what do we do here? It's between 17 and what? 7. So now you cross multiply, so it's y squared. I don't know what 17 times 7 is. I guess I could. Oops. Oh, what did I do? Wow, what's going on? It's like right by itself. That was creepy. Okay. <laughs> 17. It was. I wasn't touching anything, and all that stuff was right on there. 17 times 7. Got a haunted calcul online calculator. So it's 119. So y is the square root of 119. Just leave it like that. I know you don't like that answer. It looks ugly. It looks weird. But it's perfectly fine. Now, if you wanted to, somebody in my last class freaked out. Mr. Hammer, you said don't use a calculator. Now you're using a calculator. But look, I don't want you to write your answer that you give me as a decimal number. But if you wanted to put it in a calculator just to see if it kind of makes sense, all right, well, that's okay. Watch. The square root of 70. Let's put, whoops. Let's put the square root of 70 in there. I don't know, just to see. You don't have to put it into a calculator. I just want to see if the number makes any sense. So it's about 8.3. Does it make sense that this could be 8.3 if that was 7 and if this was 10? Yeah, absolutely. What if your number was like 54.8? Would that make any sense? No, not if that was 7 and 10. There's no way that that would be a 58 something, okay? That's all I did. I just stuck it in the calculator just to see if it kind of made sense. What about 119? What in the world is that? The square root of 119. Oops, what did I just do? Let's try this again. The square root of 119. Let's see what that is. It's about 10.9, almost 11. Does it make sense that this. Now, I didn't really. This isn't really drawn to scale necessarily, but does it make sense that this could possibly be close to this length right here? Sure, if it was drawn to scale. Now that 7 is way smaller than it should be if that was 10, would you agree? All right, so my, my triangle is not exactly to scale, but yeah, that could, at least the, these numbers are in the ballpark of where they should be. Does that make sense? All right, let's do z. So z is a geometric mean. Now finding y and z are almost the same thing, isn't it? Almost. So z is a geometric mean between what? The whole thing, 17, and the segment that's closest to z, which is 10. So z squared, I don't need a calculator on this, that's 170, and z equals the square root of 170. And that's, I'm perfectly fine. I want you to write your answers like this. Okay, I don't want you to plug it into a calculator. Just leave your answers just like this. We good? Okay. Um, let me just show you. They get a little tricky sometimes. Let me draw a triangle that looks a little different. This time it's not sitting on its hypotenuse because they could do that. They could, you know, they could um, twirl these triangles around and twist them and all that kind of stuff. Let's draw it about right there. It only works when you have a right triangle with an altitude drawn to the hypotenuse, okay? It's a pretty limited situation where this stuff actually works, but they're going to give it to you. And so here we go. There's the right triangle. Where's the where's the uh, hypotenuse on this triangle? It's this one on top, right? So the altitude would go from here up to here, wouldn't it? Okay, so there's our situation. Let me stick some numbers in here. Now, this is a little bit trickier. All right, I didn't even do this with the other class. So let's see if you can handle this. We'll call that 9. We'll call this x. Call this one y. This is 12. And this one is z. Oh, my. What do you think? Okay, all right. 
So 12 is your what? It's your geometric mean, isn't it? Exactly right. So that's where people get a little confused because you're, you're used to, you've only done, done this a couple times, but so far you're used to just putting a variable as the geometric mean, aren't you? But this time it's not a variable. They actually tell you what the geometric mean is, but you still put it in the same spot that you would if it was a variable. Okay. So 12 is your geometric mean, so I'm going to put it here and here. It's what a lot of people don't like. Okay. But after you get used to it, it's really no big deal. So the geometric mean goes here. So th this is the geometric mean between what and what? Between x and 9, right, between the two segments. So I put an x here and a 9 here. Make sense? So now you can cross multiply. You don't even have any x squared now, do you? Okay, so you get 9x equals 144, right? What's that? Comes out even, I think, doesn't it? 144 divided by 9, 16, yep. Yeah. So x is 16. So that's what that is right there. I'll put it right there. And now the rest is just the same as we did before, isn't it? Let's do y next. Y is a geometric mean, isn't it? So I put y here and y here. It's a geometric mean between what and what? You would. That's right. What is it when you add those two? It's 25. So y is a geometric mean between what, Ethan? 25 and 16. Very good. I didn't do this with the last class. I wasn't sure if they could handle what I think you guys can handle a watch. <laughs> um, I'm not going to actually plug in 25 times 16. I, I'm going to show you a little bit more how to do this um, in a couple days. Um, but instead of actually plugging that into a calculator and just taking the square root of that big old number, watch what I'm going to do. I'll show you a little bit of, you might have learned a little bit of this in Algebra 1. I'm not really sure. You'll learn a lot of this in Algebra 2. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Now, there's a reason I didn't multiply those together. Because I recognized 25 and 16. Do you? I can take the square root of 25 and get a whole number, can't I? I can take the square root of 16 and get a whole number. So watch. What if? So if I broke that down, I'd have the square root of 25 and I'd have the square root of 16. What is the square root of 25? What's the square root of 16? If I multiply them together, what's y? It's just 20. Now, if you multiply that together, you would have gotten the square root of a 400. And you can put that into a calculator, and the square root of 400 is what? It's 20. So you could have done it that way, but that's kind of a nice, easy way to do it without even having to put that into a calculator. Let's solve for z, and we'll be finished. So put a z right here and a z right here. <laughs> if you do do that way. <laughs> yeah, if you do. Yeah, if you did it that way, I, it doesn't matter as long as you come out with that answer. Okay, You still have to get a 20 because if you did it with a calculator, it still comes out to a whole number 20. right? So you still have to get 20 no matter what. Let's do Z. Z is the same deal, isn't it? Except you just use one other segment. So Z is a geometric mean between what? The whole thing and 9. Now again, this thing works out kind of nice and easy. You don't have to actually multiply 25 times 9 together because Z squared equals, watch, 25 times 9 Take the square root, right, of the whole thing. So what do you get? What's the square root of 25? What's the square root of 9? What's 5 times 3? It's 15. So z is 15. Isn't that a nice way to do it? There you go. So that's the kind of stuff you're going to see on the worksheet. I'm going to give you a worksheet. It's the front and the back. Um, that's due on Monday then, okay? That's due Monday.